Stop looking outside yourself. Every answer that you desire to know and understand in life, it's all inside you. You just need to know how to go inside to unlock it. And you will be given the answers. Hello, and welcome to the Connectedness Podcast. Just as you might have guessed, I talk about connection and connectedness on this podcast, our connection with everything in the world around us. Whether you see it or not, we're all connected, and it doesn't matter if it's our dog, our cat, our god, our body, and I'll also talk about some more abstract connections like our career or our land, our community, our emotions, your body. Life is all about connection, so the sooner we recognize that, the sooner we can have an easier, more meaningful life. I will talk about these connections through different lenses, things like synchronicities and coincidences or just everyday little bits of magic and miracles that we, we usually dismiss. It's really important that we pay attention to all of this so we can live an easier, more meaningful life. So welcome to the show. I'm your host, Karen Cleveland. Welcome back to the show, everyone. It's so great to have you here today. I'm really excited to introduce you to my guest today. So let's just say that, you know, to any outsider, Neil Elliott looked like he had a perfect life, highly educated, owned a profitable consulting firm and had a successful career, amazing wife, family. So the perfect life. But things were not all as they seemed to be. Uh, Neil was facing a lot of challenges and in a phrase, he was in a dark place. Quite by accident, he discovered a higher road. And as he traveled that road, he found the key to transforming his life. So welcome to the show, Neil. I'm very happy to have you here. Oh, thank you, Karen. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so I want to start with hearing about that great life that you had, you know, kind of paint a picture of what was going on. But how did you find yourself in this dark space. So what started being the key indicators that things weren't right for you? I'll answer that and we'll back up. Okay, sure. Deeply depressed and done with life. Mm. It seemed like whatever I was, how much, didn't matter how much money I was making, didn't matter where we traveled, didn't matter, you know, who I engaged with. I was just fed up and not happy with life. And I thought that you know, if this is what life is about, I don't need to be doing this. That's a sad place to be. It was, in the end, a very good place to be. But yes, while you're in it, it's pretty sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So give you a little background. So sure. born in 1960, youngest of six. My father died when I was five years old. My mom went out, got a job. And... I ended up, uh, you know, after graduating, I got an engineering degree and then I got an MBA and I managed large projects in the hydroelectric industry for, you know, over 30 years, small to large. And in 2002, I went from employment into consulting. And then in consulting, you know, you don't get paid when you don't work. So if you're sick, you don't get paid. If you take vacation, you don't get paid. All that stuff. You don't get paid for stats. And so life became about, you know, ensuring I was always on top of my game to please the client to get repeat work. Mm -hmm. And since I didn't get paid when I didn't work or took time off, it was work, work, work. Now, my wife and I still went on vacation and we'd take a chunk of time and do that. But other than that, it was lots of hours, lots of work. And we built this beautiful waterfront home north of where we live here. And it required a ferry and a three hour drive to get from the city back and forth. So we had to come in and keep visiting clients in the city. And, you know, we'd either spend time in a hotel or we'd rent an apartment. So we're carrying two places, you know, right. a, a place in the city and then a really expensive waterfront home. And so that debt load required a lot of income. Yeah. And so in order to maintain that, you know, we worked. And was the most peaceful idyllic spot and when we were there loved it but it was really the debt load was crushing mm -hmm. and from 2002 to 2015 you know I was 
doing really well, but I was slowly, unknowingly and unwittingly to me, driving myself into this really deep, dark, despondent depression. And in 2015, I realized I was there. I was trying to get out of it. My wife didn't know I was there. Family, friends didn't know. Clients certainly didn't know. In 2017, our house had been on the market for five years previously, finally sold in November of 2017. My wife jumped on a plane to go to Toronto, Ontario, Canada to visit family and friends. We're in this little one bedroom rental apartment in the city. I sat down, I crafted my suicide note, I planned out my suicide and I was planning it out for about three months so I could ensure we got moved, get rid of all the stuff we accumulate, you know, like fills up closets and attics and stuff and really, you know, kind of relieve that burden for my wife and say goodbye to family and friends without them knowing that's what I was going to do. And so I crafted that, I put it away and about a week prior, some material fortuitously arrived that promised to liberate me from my thinking if I studied it and I followed it. So I thought, okay, well, I'll give this one last chance. If it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I can always pull the trigger. So I started studying this material in mid-November 2017. And by the time, you know, we moved and it was time to pull the trigger, I thought, okay, no, this seems to be, you know, I have hope for the first time for a very long time. I have hope. So I kept studying. And in December of 2018, so about 13 months later, I went into these two meditations, two days apart, and I got into the meditation. All of a sudden, this spiritual energy uh, flowed in through the crown of my head, and then it just filled my body. And then just in a flash, it just enveloped me like a deep sea diver suspended in the middle of the ocean, just enveloped me in unconditional love. And I didn't care what aches and pains my body had. I didn't care what illnesses I had. I didn't care what anybody had done to me in the past. I didn't care about anything. I just wanted to stay there forever. Mm -hmm. I came out of that meditation. And two days later, I had the exact same meditation. Mm. And at that point, I knew that this material I followed, that this process I followed, this new knowledge I gained, and the practice of this new knowledge brought me back to to our truth, to who we really are, where we come from, and where we return to after death, which is a state of unconditional love. And so then I've just carried on since then, and uh, things just get better and better and better. You know, I have challenges, I still working on things, but yeah, Yeah. absolutely. (laughs) So it took just a little over a year before you had that experience when you started the meditative process. Yeah. Okay. And so you kept at it. You didn't carry out your three-month plan. You thought something was happening. So were you, you were just feeling a little bit of hope at the time, although there weren't any external signs or internal signs. You just kind of felt better? Or what, yeah, it, yeah, what kept you going? It was, well, one, the material, like, so engineer, and I needed certain things that made sense, some things that were logical and seemed rational to me to be able to bridge this gap between spirituality and science. And this material did that. And it did it in a way that, you know, was logical to me. And it and it promised, if you will, that if I kept with this and continued to learn it and continued to cycle through the material, to get a deeper understanding of it, that these insights would come to me. And so I started to feel a little bit better. I was still depressed, but I felt hope. I felt like there was, there's, there could possibly be light at the end of the tunnel. So I didn't want to give up because I thought that there might be something better on the other side. And these changes happen so subtly and imperceptibly. You don't actually understand that they're going on until one day you have an experience. Mm -hmm. So at about the seven month mark, I felt this little tingling at the top of the head. Mm. I didn't know what it was. And it was about the size of a dime. And I thought, well, that feels really weird, you know, and but I thought, okay, well, I'll just keep going. And then over time, that grew, you know, and when it got to about four or five inches in diameter, I thought, oh, I know what's going on. You know, I was impressing new brain cells with new knowledge, 
that were operating at a higher frequency. And that allowed me to make connection with source, whether you want to call it yeah. God, Yahweh, the Tao, whatever. Yeah. And so I made this, this connection and then this energy would flow in my body, would come in through my head and it might stay in my head or it might be in my chest or it might go into my solar plexus. And then it started to move up and down, go down one side of my body, up the other side, it go down all of my body, then back up. It would be in all three places at once. So it, it was doing various things depending on, you know, what day it was when I was meditating, so to speak, not really right. based on the day, but as I right. progressed every day meditating, it was doing these things. And then near the end of December, I had these two extraordinary experiences that we don't even have the human language to describe. Yeah. And since then, so that was back in 18. So that's five years, you know, ish ago. Yep. Um, have they continued to happen? Those experiences? Oh, yeah, even more so. Like, uh, just it, it varies and stuff. And I've been, I've stuck with this material, but I have branched out. And I have learned other things that are based in science that are logical and rational to give me even a deeper understanding and that and so now i totally know for myself i totally know that you know this is this path of ascension and you know it's because we're all here having these experiences that we desire to have you know everybody's path and experience will be different although there's going to be similarities right and we're all headed to the same place it's just what path that you're choosing in the moment today to experience that's gonna you know take you to that point True. and so you know i have a lot more knowledge about it i have more knowledge about quantum physics at this point and and about how to use the quantum field and so i've expanded my understanding yeah so i'd love to talk about that in just a minute i'd like to talk about coincidences sometimes and i'm just curious so you said that this material had come in the mail about a week before did you order it or was it random no Did i didn't come in the mail oh, i was doing I'm... so i was doing a search for i can't remember what it was now but it was something by saint germain i believe anyway i was doing a search and i couldn't find that material but this material came up instead oh, okay and i thought okay. oh that looks interesting so I thought, okay, well, I'll look at it. Yeah. And so I, I got a copy of it and then I started reading it and, and okay. it was just so logical and rational to me. Yeah. So that was kind of, I mean, you, you weren't expecting it. It was a little bit random, a little bit of a coincidence that it came to you when it did at just the right time, it seems to me. So um, yes. I understand that you've written a book about you know, not only your experience, but what you've continued to learn since then. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your book right now? Yeah, absolutely. So the, just so everybody knows, the book is called A Higher Road, Cleanse Your Consciousness to Transcend the Ego and Ascend Spiritually. And I offer a seven-step process to inner peace, joy, love, abundance, and prosperity. And I can tell you that no matter where you are in life, whether you're ill or healthy, happy, depressed, whether you live on the street or you live in a mansion, you have the ability and the power to change your life right where you are. You just need the right process. You need to be open to it. You need the right process and you need to follow a, a practice to make it happen. And if you do that, I can guarantee you, you will change your life. So the book itself has five parts. First parts, what you're going to learn and the emotional state I was in, just setting the book up, giving everybody a precursor, if you will, and what you're going to learn through the book. Second part is a really candid memoir. I share my experiences in life and these beliefs I adopted to be right, wrong, good, bad, true, false, that unknowingly and unwittingly to me created every event and every experience that came into my life to teach mm. me the lessons that I needed to learn to have the experiences that, you know, my soul wanted to experience. Yeah. And part three is a chapter in consciousness to get everybody up to the, all the readers up to the same understanding of what consciousness is. And that may be 
old hack for some, it may be brand new for others, but bring everybody up to the same point. Part four is I share some of these truths and the brilliance of this writing and this material, and I provide the links and everything so you can get the material if you're interested in it. Part five is my experience as I progress through the seven steps that I offer people to change their lives. So that's kind of the outline of the book. Okay. So anyone can, you know, in theory, get it, read through it. And you said in the part three is about coming together in consciousness, attempting to start from the same place. Is that what I heard? Because a consciousness is a big subject. And I'm curious what kind of ways you bring people or you propose people start from a certain kind of consciousness. You know, consciousness, there's the being awake, just conscious, subconscious, unconscious, you know, falling asleep. There's all these different definitions. So maybe that's what I want to start with is your definition of consciousness in that part and what people can do to begin to raise their consciousness. So what I do is I set out a definition which is consistent with dictionary definitions of what consciousness is. And so we start everybody off in the same place. And then what I do is I explain to people the things that I needed to understand and how I got that understanding, what books I read that brought me that understanding. So the first thing I needed to get straight after this, you know, standard definition of what consciousness is, is that what we believe to be right, wrong, good, bad, truth, true, false is really just a belief. And this is the belief that we adopt, you know, given the environment we've grown up in, given, you know, kind of who we are and, you know, who we are at soul level and the things that we want to learn for this lifetime, if you will, and the things that we reinforce as we grow from babyhood to adulthood. And we can get more into that, but, you know, we're limited on time today. So, uh, so the first thing I had to do was get an understanding that if things that I thought is right, wrong, good, bad, true, false are really just beliefs, that means if I wanted to, I could change those beliefs. I just needed a process to do it. And things that we embed in our subconscious and unconscious mind as we're growing up and adopting these beliefs, they become like concrete. They're very hard to break up and dissolve. So you, you actually need a process to do that. And then the second thing I needed to learn, and this is all based in science now, is I needed to learn and understand that what we think about can affect our biology, mm. can bring health, draw health to us, or be you know contrary to it, bring us mm. illnesses. And so everything that you think has an effect on your body, not only your mental state, but also all directly on your body. And so I offered these books, you know, suggestions for people if they want to read it. The third thing I needed to learn was that, and I did this through some books on neuroplasticity, was that science has discovered that people with brain injuries that have damaged parts of their brain can actually correct some of those things through a process. So the brain is very malleable and pliable. And it's not like it's atrophying over your life. It really depends on what you think and what you do and how you go about it. And so Mm -hmm. you can actually change how your brain actually works and the pathways in it. And then to further stretch everybody to start to understand a new concept of consciousness other than textbook definitions, I share a near-death experience of a woman who had at age 46, had suffered from five years of a very aggressive cancer. Mm. And she went from a normal body weight to 75 to 90 pounds. And in that final few moments, she had tumors some the size of the lemons, and her body was riddled with cancer from her waist to her head. She couldn't keep her head up on her own. She required oxygen 24-7, and she required 24-7 care, and she was at home. She fell into a coma. They rushed her to the hospital. The admitting physicians told her family she was not going to make it through the night. She went into this coma and she experienced, she had a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. She woke up 24 hours later, declared she was going to be totally okay. 
And two weeks later, they couldn't find a trace of cancer in her body. Wow. They don't know how. They just call it spontaneous remission because they, yeah. they can't explain it. But what she does is she explains what she experienced in that near-death experience. And, you know, some of the things that she explained was that, you know, we come from unconditional love. We returned unconditional love. We all are. Consciousness is in everything, a tree, a rock, a plant, a bush, the planet, you know, the, in the galaxy. And so this, if you read this book and you can, you know, you might not grasp it, really understand it, like know it, but you can read it and understand it from an intellectual level. And that book actually gave me, because I always, I didn't grow up, I grew up agnostic, had no religious training, but I had this kind of hangover, if you will, from things that I'd been explained to me that if I committed suicide, I'd go to a really bad place. So I was always fearful about committing suicide. This book, she came back and one of the messages was, no matter what you do in life, you're not judged for it. That gave me permission to sit down to write my suicide note and plan out my suicide. And so then in the next part of the book, I share these truths. And so you will learn if you go through this, you're going to learn some things that are very rational. You don't have to be a scientist or an engineer to understand them. They're explained in very logical terms, things we know in science today that will help you start to understand who we really are. And so I'll just, I'll jump to a conclusion here of what I learned. But to understand it, you actually, you know, you, you need some process to go through to understand it, or at least I did, mm-hmm. and is that we are consciousness. There's nothing that exists that is not consciousness. Consciousness is. And our creator, is, whether you call it God, Yahweh, the Tao, whatever, our creator is in a state of silence and stillness and equilibrium of opposing impulses. And these posing impulses were torn apart at the time of the Big Bang. Um, Our source exists always in a state of equilibrium, but this new state of source exists in a state of activity and also in silence and stillness. And we are the product. So, you know, we can talk about Newtonian physics, that ex- that's explained in this material to describe how we are here and manifested for and how things have evolved out of these primal impulses. Or today, I could also talk about quantum physics and theories of quantum physics. But more importantly, you don't have to understand the math of quantum physics. If you really want a, another level of understanding, there is another opportunity to learn about how we use the quantum field every moment of every day to project who we are in every situation and gives you the tools to actually, at a structural level, understanding the structure can actually help you move to the state of a higher vibrational frequency consistently so that you're on this path of ascension more swiftly if you will now everybody's exactly where they need to be (laughs) everybody is you know looked after and taken care of and it is you know i'm just going to say this it's totally up to you there's no right there's no wrong there's no good there's no bad is just choices that you make in terms of how you want to experience this ascension process Mm -hmm. so you get to make the choices. You're in total control. You know, we think our bodies are, are who we are. And it's this body is just a tool. This body is just a vehicle to carry around our soul. Mm-hmm. And who you really are, this, this experience that you're having right now is barely a fragment of the tip of your little finger in terms of who you really are. You are a very powerful being. And we've just forgotten it while we're here. So that's outside of the book. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> so you talked a little bit that you've studied, you know, some of the quantum science and neuroplasticity and, and all these things. I'm wondering how you explain. So the woman that was in the coma and woke up two weeks later had no tumors on her body. 
how do you explain that? You know, I know they say it's spontaneous remission, but in a less scientific terminology, I guess. How how does that happen? So this is now me talking. Yep. <laughs> yep. So I'm going to say that because of her experience, she actually knew and understood and retained that with her, who she really was. And by knowing who she really was and knowing the truth of who she really was, then she expressed that truth every moment of every day. Mm -hmm. And by doing that and coming back into alignment with who she really is at soul level, her body then became this, you know, channel, open and purified channel of the divine that would heal itself. So we, so your, you know, you think with electrical impulses in the brain, you feel with magnetic impulses in the nervous system. Your thinking, every thought you have, every word you use, every thought you have, every deed you take, every thought's a creative consciousness plan, and your feelings are magnetic in nature, and they draw energy particles together to create a like event or a like experience that is going to come to you to help you wake up, to help you first experience the things you want to experience, and then to make a choice of taking control in that moment and changing your life. But you need some tools to do that, and you need to understand why you're doing it. And so when I look at somebody today, everybody is perfect. Your soul is unconditional love, just like everybody's soul. Unconditional love, it is perfect. The things that they're doing that we think are so vile and horrible and uh, negative are really just... It's based in their thinking and the things they want to experience. And everything that you think puts this out. And the more you think about it, the more it, the quicker it draws these particles of energy together to come back with a like event or like experience. So when you do negative things, when you have negative thoughts, when you have denigrating thoughts, when you have vengeful thoughts, judgmental thoughts, those things will come back to show themselves to you. You are really just a projection of my consciousness and you are giving me feedback <laughs> based on my feelings and my thinking. And for you, I am a projection of your consciousness giving you feedback. So, you know, it gets a little more complicated than, you know, someone may be starting out and they might not understand that. But you will come to learn all of these things that give you an insight into what you're doing moment by moment, and then you can start to make choices. So somebody comes at me and they might be yelling and screaming and angry with me. I am immediately the neutral observer. Yeah. I do not let it trigger an emotion in me. I observe it. I thank it. Thank God silently. Thank that person. Give them gratitude for bringing and showing me where I am in the quantum field. Making a conscious choice to ensure that my emotion is positive and then follow it with a positive thought and then take a positive action. And what that does is that takes you and helps raise your vibrational frequency. And the more you can do that moment by moment by moment, you start to create these events and experiences that come into your life that are positive and life-giving and loving and kind. And it takes practice. You know, you can read a book to become a doctor but you're not a doctor until you practice a lot. Right. right. So same thing. You read the books, you understand the material. It takes moment to moment practice and it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. It's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, it is a journey, isn't it? You mentioned going through the process to to break some of our, I think, belief systems or beliefs. And how much time a day do you think a person needs to spend well, I guess there's no need, but, you know, ideally, what kind of a, a time frame do people need to practice on a daily basis? Or does it just, you know, gradually, whatever works for the person? What do you recommend for that? 
So let me come at this a little bit sideways, but I will answer your question. One of the things that I understood, I tried meditating in the 90s and in early 2000s. And I'd meditate for 15, 20 minutes and, you know, try that. And I, you know, buy the CD, you know, 20 different ways to meditate, try all of those. And, you know, it felt fine and it felt good. And, but it, I didn't see any visible change. So I'd do it for two, three weeks and then give up. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I had to learn when I was reading this material, and it comes later, you're learning a bunch of new knowledge first, and then you learn how to do this, but is the purpose of meditation. So because source is in a state of silence and stillness and emits unconditional love to everything in creation at every moment of every day, every nanosecond of every day, it cannot enter into your human consciousness and make itself known to you until you start to raise your vibrational frequency. And so the first thing I had to learn was the purpose of meditation, the real purpose, in my opinion, the real purpose of meditation is, is to make connection with source. And then in order to do that, you need to do a few things. You need to get into a place of silence, stillness in your mind. You need to stop all of your thought. And you can do it, right? Because I did it. I know it can be done because I do it. Doesn't mean it's going to happen every day. Doesn't mean it doesn't take practice, you know. So it took me a few months to be able to train myself to stop all my thoughts. But when, as soon as I could get my thoughts, then source could start to actually make itself known to me. Right. And when that does, that just gives you feedback to keep going. So you, you need to, and you need to be honest with yourself about how you really feel about life. And because you need to be able to, in this process, so I'll give you this, this process. So first thing I do is I, I stretch everybody's consciousness to get everybody on the same page and give you a new concept to consciousness. Second thing is to unveil some truths to hopefully give you nuggets of information and uh, samples of the writing to entice you to actually learn more. The third thing is a reflection step. And so the first thing you're going to do when you start this process, is you're going to sit down, you're going to write yourself a letter, and you're going to be really honest. It's, the letter is only for you. It's not for a spouse or a family, a friend, or your, you know, anybody, your doctor, no one. And no one will ever see it, only you. So it is an opportunity for you to sit down and write yourself a letter about how you really feel about life. Mm -hmm. And so you're really conscious. Then you're going to seal it. You're going to put it away and you're going to open it a year later. And you're doing that because you're benchmarking where you're at. Right. And then you're going to see the change when you open the letter a year later, if you carry on with the work. Yeah. So then the first thing you're going to do is you're going to cleanse your consciousness. And there's a very specific process to get rid of all of these negative beliefs that you have, all of these beliefs that are causing you, all of these things that you experience that you don't like. And so there's a set of things that you go through in a process you go through to, to, to begin this process to cleanse. And then at the same time, you're going to start rebuilding your consciousness to be congruent and consistent with where we come from and where we return to after death. And then the sixth thing you're going to do is you're going to learn this daily meditation and you're going to practice on stopping your thoughts. And there's ways, I suggest ways to do that in the book. And you can start with five, 10 minutes meditating, whatever works for you. I meditate 90 minutes a day, I, somewhere between an hour and two hours, depending on the day, but typically 90 minutes a day. Yeah. And I do it first thing in the morning before my brain gets active with other things. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I want to be able to just stop my thoughts. Right. And then step seven is a rinse and repeat. You got to cycle through. It's not a one and done. <laughs> You're going to continue to do it. So I meditated every day. And then I started that little, about the seven month mark is when I started to feel yeah. that contact. I didn't know that's what it was, but that's what it was. So it was the beginning of that contact. But up until that time, you know, I was practicing, practicing, practicing. And that was still happening. Source was still entering into me. Source was still helping me go through this process of this cleansing and rebuilding. I just didn't feel it and I didn't know it. Right. But the material was so logical and rational and the process made sense to me 
I just, I continued following it. So I did it in faith. Yeah. I did it in faith that something better would come out of it. Yeah. Yeah. At some point you had faith. And I think it's good to note that you didn't really have anything definitive to know it was working for seven months, but you stuck with it anyway. And I think that's where some people, like you did in the 90s, I think you said, you just, you know, you stopped doing it because for whatever reason, people stop if they don't see immediate results in this fast food society that we have. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to note. So if you wanted people to know something, if you wanted the entire world to know something, what do you wish everyone knew about themselves or about life? Well, I, you know, if everybody could really understand that their body is not who they are mm. and that these experiences that they're experiencing is of their own creation and they can change that if they desire, they just need the right knowledge and the right tools to make that happen and then be consistent with it. Mm -hmm. For the listener, I tell you, I promise you, <clears throat> No matter where you are in life, if you're unhappy with life in any way, shape, or form, you can totally transform it. You just have to be open and willing and learn some new material and then follow the practice. And you've got to develop this faith. And the thing that, that developed faith for me was the logic and the rationality of this material that I studied. Now, there's many paths to the top of the mountain. You know, most people, there's a lot of people think differently than I do, and you might need some other thing. But I think the thing is, as soon as you find something that seems to speak to you, seems to resonate with you, then stick with it. Don't give up on it. Yeah. And don't expect immediate results. We are too suffited with the, you know, fast food. It was a good a description, right? Fast food. I want it now. I, you know, I want it quickly. And, uh, yeah. you know, and I expect to get a result immediately. Yeah. And I think the other thing, the other most important thing is stop looking outside yourself. Every mm -hmm. answer that you desire to know and understand in life, it's all inside you. You just need to know how to go inside to unlock it and you will be given the answers. Mm, beautiful. I love that. Thank you. All right, Neil. And uh, for the listeners that are listening and not watching in front of a computer, the no, your your information will be in the show notes, but can you tell people where to find your book and the name again? Yeah, so the book is A Higher Road, Cleanse Your Consciousness to Transcend the Ego and Ascend Spiritually, A Seven-Step Process to Inner Peace, Joy, Love, Abundance, and Prosperity. It's by D, initial D, D, Neil Elliott, and it's available globally wherever books are sold. Uh, if you order it through the bookstore, you might need the ISBN number to order it. You can certainly look it up on Amazon. You can get it in, you know, all your favorite ebook forms, Kindle, Apple, Nook, Kobo. You get it hardcover or paperback. And you can get to my website to learn more at ahigherroad.com. All one, you know, all one word, concatenated, ahigherroad.com. And you can get a link to the book there as well. Fantastic. So ahigherroad.com. Go to see Neil Elliott. That's where I'll be headed after we're done recording here. So thank you for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to hear about this. And can I ask one last question is, at what point what, did you share your suicide note with your wife? Or did you? I have never shared the suicide note itself. What I have done is after two years, well, when I started to write this book in 2019, that's when I shared my story with my wife. Okay. And she was not happy. She was, she didn't know, you know, she's like, how could I not know? Right. And I can tell you right. any spouse, you don't, you know, we don't know what's actually going on in somebody else's mind. Right. They can be affable and they can be kind. They might be the most miserable in the most miserable state. And you just don't know it. We're all great actors in our environment. We wear this facade. We project whatever we want. Mm -hmm. But what's really going on inside, you don't know the inner reality of another person. So careful with your assumptions. So true. Thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Karen. It was a pleasure speaking with you. All right. And goodbye to the listeners. I hope to connect with you again soon.
Bye bye. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to head over to RevKarenPodcast.com. That's R E V K A R E N Podcast.com. There you're going to find the tools for finding more meaning and happiness in your own life. Plus, if you have a story that you want to share with me, either on or off the air, be sure to look for that form. Make sure you follow me so you get notified when new episodes drop. And also, I'd love to connect with you in my Facebook group, Connectedness with Rev Karen. So head over to RevKarenPodcast.com. I hope to see you there.